right. You see my screen okay? Yes. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll start when you give me the signal, Constantinos. Yes. Yes, in uh, three, four minutes, we should uh, start. I will let you know, I'll give you a signal and I will make a short introduction of, of you and then we can start your presentation. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Damien, I think uh, I should start to uh, give a small introduction about yourself. Okay. Uh, it is a great pleasure uh, having you via distance here with us at CII. Uh, we, we know each other a little bit uh, from the past, and I'm very happy that uh, you agreed to give this uh, webinar for our researchers here, <coughs> here in Cyprus, excuse me. The professor uh, Damian McElveny is a epidemiologist and biostatistician at the Institute of Occupational Medicine. He's working in the data science and epidemiology section of the research division of the Institute. He actually has a uh, lot of experience, more than 30 years working primarily in the cancer epidemiology field uh, in the occupational sector and he's also leading a number of consultancy projects that relate medical and legal uh, issues in occupational epidemiology. He's also leading the brain and heading studies that uh, these are very interesting studies that examine the effect of uh, concussion and heading football on elite athletes. He's uh, actually also the secretary of the UK Ireland Occupational and Environmental Epidemiology Society, and he's also a honorary member of the Society of Occupational Medicine. Today, Professor McAlvenny will uh, introduce us to the field of occupational epidemiology, and uh, we were very much happy for having you on board. Dear Damian, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, and uh, good afternoon to everybody. Um, I've got quite a lot of material packed into this presentation, so it's my intention to go through it relatively quickly, given that I'm recording the session 
and also going to make my slides available. So um, hopefully we'll have time at the end for some questions and I'm happy to stay on um, for a while after the, the end of the presentation to answer any questions that people may have. So to start with, what is epidemiology? Well, it's a study of uh, the causes and determinants of diseases in people and it's important to note that it's an observational rather than an experimental science. And um, and so occupational epidemiology, which is what this, which is the subject of what we're interested in today, is a, it's epidemiology essentially in relation to workplace exposures. So what we want to study is how often diseases occur in different groups of workers and why. And like other branches of epidemiology, it's fundamentally concerned with the prevention of disease. And usually our aim is to identify and then investigate hypotheses about causal links between particular hazards, occupational hazards and diseases. So um, epidemiology can be traced as far back as Hippocrates, um, who lived uh, 460 to 370 BC. And there's a famous quote where he admonished physicians to explore patients' environmental lifestyle and vocational background when diagnosing and treating diseases. And more recently, Bernardo Ramazzini, who's often acknowledged as the father of modern day occupational medicine, described occupationally occupationally related diseases in his book De Morbis Artificum, in, published in 1700. Um, so in, the, in terms of modern day early occupational diseases, we have things like uh, respiratory impairment or silicosis in stonemasons, eye disorders in glass blowers, neurological toxicity in tradesmen exposed to mercury. And the recognition of many well-known occupational hazards can be traced back to the observations of acute physicians or to the workers themselves. <clears throat> and many of the modern occupational methods that we use today, or many of the methods that are used in epidemiology in general, were developed within the occupational field. And many occupational health risks initially were initially identified by examining case series or clusters of disease. So for example, in 1895, the occupational physician Ludwig Rind observed three cases of bladder cancer in workers exposed to aromatic amines in a, in a dye factory. And as we know, uh, and have discovered since through formal epidemiological studies, a lot, a lot of aromatic amines have been associated with um, increased risk of bladder cancer. And another example, rare tumours of uh, the blood vessel in the liver, angiosarcoma, occurs in workers exposed to vinyl chloride monomer in the production of polyvinyl chloride. And that's one of those rare diseases which is almost exclusively occupational in nature. You very rarely see spontaneous angiosarcoma of the liver outside workplaces. So there are different types of epidemiological study. There's descriptive studies uh, which describe the patterns and trends in health and diseases in populations and they can be good for generating hypotheses. So what we usually want to know is what is the health issue of concern? Who were affected? Where, where did they work? Um, what's the time period over which they were exposed? And um, is there a causal association or a mode of transmission that explains the, the occurrence of the disease? A classic example of this, although it's not strictly an occupational example, is uh, the physician John Snow and his observations in relation to the cholera, cholera outbreak in London in the, I think it's the 1840s. And what John Snow did was a very methodical mapping of 
the cases of cholera and through that mapping he was able to identify a particular pump in Broad Street that the majority of cases were using and thus identified the source of the outbreak of the disease. So <coughs> descriptive epidemiology has its uses and in case of infectious diseases can be used to identify the source of a problem. However, to study things more generally, we need a more formal epidemiological approach. And we do that using analytical epidemiological studies. And these studies test hypotheses that exposure X is associated with disease Y. In other words, increases the risk of the disease. And a key, a key feature of analytical methods is the notion of a comparison group where we compare exposures, compare the uh, experience of those exposed and unexposed or compare low, medium and high exposed groups in relation to the rate at which they get disease in the future. And the main types of analytical studies are cross-sectional case control and cohort and they can be used each of these can be used to study acute and chronic health effects although some of them are better at studying certain types of uh, health outcome than others and I'll go on to say a little bit more about that in a, in a short while. So cross-sectional studies um, the information on health and exposure is collected from each subject in a population, usually at a single point in time or a very short time period. And statistical tests of association between the exposure and the health outcome are carried out. And an example of this is a study in carbon black workers. It was a European study with about 2,500 workers in the carbon black manufacturing industry. They were exposed to dust and um, they all had respiratory symptoms. Lung, lung function measurements were taken, respiratory symptom questionnaires administered, and chest radiographs carried out. And personal dust measurements were also taken. And an association was found such that uh, carbon black exposure was associated with a decrease in lung function. Now whether that is causal, you need to examine uh, effects over time. So, so cross-sectional studies, because they're looking at things in one place in time, um, make, it makes it harder to determine whether an association that's found is causal or not. So to give you some specific numbers, so here we, we We've got data from the carbon black study in which um, data are for um, to, uh, tobacco smoking and whether or not workers had a cough and also carbon black smoke uh, exposure. And the carbon black exposure is adjusted for cigarette smoking and the tobacco smoking results are adjusted for carbon black exposure. And we can see that um, the incidence of cough is associated with the level of tobacco smoking and there's also an ind independent increase in risk of uh, cough due to carbon black exposure. If we also use the same study to look at lung function in tobacco smoking with uh, carbon black exposure, we can also see that the higher rate of tobacco smoking is associated with a reduced uh, lung capacity. And the same is true of carbon black exposure. So what we really need to do is to use a study design which examines the effect of exposures over time. And the first of these two major types of studies are case control studies. So it compares people with a condition, cases, to a similar group of people without the condition who are controls. And the aim is to identify the risk factors which may have caused the cases to get the condition in the first place. So in this diagram, 
we essentially have two groups, the cases and the controls, and we compare past exposures to the agent of interest. And the question we ask ourselves is, is exposure greater in cases than in controls? And therefore, is it a plausible explanation for why those cases have become cases? Um, this is just an example of a study I was involved in, which is looking at the risk of meningioma and occupational exposure to selected combustion products. It was a large multinational case control study of brain cancer. And um, one of the things we found in this study was um, it was the first study to identify a statistical association between exposure to oil mists and meningioma. Now that may be a true association or it may be a chance finding. And one of the things about epidemiology is that you need an accumulation of evidence across a number of studies. Uh, and I'll say a little bit more about how you determine causality from epidemiology studies uh, a little bit later in the talk. The other main type of analytical study is a cohort study, where we follow up one or more groups of people over time and compare the occurrence of disease or the incidence rate of disease in the various exposed populations, subpopulations. And it's longitudinal and we can take repeated measurements of exposure over time. We can also look at repeated snapshots over time with the disease experience. One group's usually exposed to the risk, a risk factor while the other's not, or alternatively, we can look at different exposure levels. And these studies can be prospective, uh, although if you're looking at a long latency disease, it can take many years uh, for the study to be powerful enough to show an effect. And what we more usually do is a retrospective cohort study where we look back in time and compare the, the disease incidence in high, medium and low exposed and see it as an association with the exposure of interest. So again, representing this diagonal, uh, diagrammatically, of um, exposed and unexposed groups, we follow them up over time and we compare the incidence rate in those who are exposed with those who are uh, not exposed. And likewise, we can also look at high, medium and low exposure as well as exposed or unexposed. Or we can, we can look at exposure response in even more detail than that. So an example of a cohort study, uh, this is the diesel exhaust miners study, um, in which exposure to diesel exhaust in miners was um, used to see if it posed a risk of developing lung cancer. And it was quite a large retrospective cohort study of 12,000 workers in eight non-metal mines. And the exposure of interest was respirable elemental carbon and vital status was assessed at the end of 1997. So that's whether a person's died or not, and if so, what they died of. And you can see, not very clearly perhaps, but this is the exposure patterns over time. And it's a, it's a rather complex picture. And this at the bottom is exposure risk profiles for different subgroups of the population. So this study found an association between elemental carbon and risk of uh, lung cancer. Another example is mortality from solid tumours amongst workers in formaldehyde industries. And this is a study carried out by the National Cancer Institute in the US and it found an, uh, an excess risk of nasal pharyngeal cancer and also leukemia that was associated with formaldehyde exposure. And this study was very influential in the International Agency for Research on Cancer determining that formaldehyde was a definite human carcinogen. So there are a number of advantages and disadvantages to the three main types of analytical epidemiological study. Cross-sectional studies are relatively cheap and 
quick to undertake and you can look at multiple outcomes at the same time but it's very difficult to determine cause and effect in a cross-sectional study where you're looking at things at one point in time and the timing of the snapshot is doesn't come with a guarantee that you're going to get a representative picture of the association between the disease and the, out, uh, the exposure and the disease of interest. Case control studies are generally good for looking at rare diseases or diseases with a long latency period. They're not good for studying rare exposures and generally they can only look at a single outcome at a time, although you can overlay more than one case control study within the same uh, population. Cohort studies in terms of occupation are the ones that give the clear indication of cause and effect and you can look at multiple outcomes uh, associated with the exposure of interest but they are expensive undertakings and they're not an efficient way to study rare diseases. A key aspect to any occupational study is good exposure data and in particular um, exposure data can come in a variety of forms. It can be very general such as occupation or job um, and somebody could be classified as ever or never exposed or you could calculate the duration of employment. But what we prefer to have is some measure of intensity of agent, which in combination with duration of exposure can give us a, a cumulative exposure. There are exceptions to this. Um, Eutodiene in association is associated with cumulative peak exposures uh, as giving a, an increased risk of leukemia. But in general, it's cumulative exposure that we're generally interested in. And often you have to rely on um, exposure data that's been collected for regulatory compliance purposes. And so could be an upper estimate of exposure rather than what you want for epidemiological studies, which is a best estimate of exposure. And although the different studies produce different uh, risk measures, they're, they're all generally thought of as being relative risks and the relative risk is defined as the ratio of the probability of disease occurring in an exposed group to the probability of that same event occurring in a comparison or unexposed group. And so in cohort studies you will often see standardised morbidity or mortality ratios and sometimes standard rate ratios where there's an internal comparison uh, rather than an external comparison. In case control studies, we usually have odds ratios and the relative risk greater than one indicates providing the confidence interval suggests it's so an increased risk of disease. So there are a number of measures of disease frequency and the two main in a, in a population and the two main ones we look at are incidence which is the number of new cases of disease that develop in a specific time period and prevalence which is the total number of cases in a disease of disease in a population at any one point in time and they're usually expressed in the form of rates so just to give you a numerical example um, the number of new cases per hundred thousand per year is calculated for asthma in England in 2012. Number of new cases is 146,000. The mid-year population estimate in 2012 for England was 53.5 million. So the incidence rate works out at 273 cases of asthma per 100,000 during 2012. Prevalence is the total number of cases of disease in the population at one point in time, taken as the proportion of the total number of persons in that population, and it's sometimes referred to as a point prevalence. Uh, period prevalence is a variation which represents the number of persons who are a case at any time during a period as a proportion of the total number of people in that population. And so here we have an example of 
cases of uh, cold infections in a student class size 20. So if we want to know what is the incidence in February, well, it's the number of new cases, which is one, two, three, four. And the point prevalence um, is the number of cases that occurred at any time during the month, so that's six. And um, the period prevalence is the number of cases that occurred during the, the whole time window. So there are issues when uh, we encounter when calculating disease rates. So how do you define what's the case? It's fairly easy with cancer. You've usually got a cancer registry, but sometimes if you're looking at something which is not part of a routine registration system, you need to understand what the clinical diagnosis, diagnostic criteria are in order to determine what's a case. Diseases can also be misclassified. Um, people who've had an exposure of concern might be more likely to over-report being exposed to the exposure of interest. How do you define your population at risk? And we also need to think about some diseases, for example, solid cancers can sometimes take 10, 15 or even more years to manifest themselves following the exposure of interest. So clearly if somebody's exposed and they get a cancer the following year, it's highly unlikely that the cancer is due to the agent concerned, unless that person happened to have some prior exposure from perhaps a previous employment. So suppose we observe a difference in incidence between exposed and unexposed groups. There are different possible explanations. So the one we would like it to be sometimes is that the exposure is the cause of disease, but it could also be due to a special type of bias called confounding, or it could be biases in the study design, or it could be a chance association. And we need to, when drawing conclusions from an epidemiological investigation, we need to give weight to all of these um, as possible explanations for the findings of a study. So bias can result from a systemat systematic error in design, it can result from the way in which people are recruited into a study, it can result from data collection or analysis results uh, in the mistaken estimation of the true effect. Confounding is a special type of bias and it's a situation that occurs when the effect or the association between an exposure and an outcome is distorted by the presence of another variable. So what that really means is that, for example, if we're interested in the association between asbestos exposure and lung cancer, often the cigarette smoking is the confounder of that association. And for cigarette smoking to be a confounder, it has to be associated with both the outcome of interest, lung cancer, and also the asbestos exposure. Effect modification occurs when it's, we have a variable that differenti differentially modifies the observed effect. So that could be something like gender. So for example, for a particular exposure, men might be more susceptible than women or the other way around. And so in those situations, gender would be an effect modifier. So here's another example of a confounding example, of a confounding. So we have alcohol consumption as being hypothesized as increasing the risk of throat cancer. Smoking is, a, is also a potential risk factor for throat cancer. But if, if those who smoke more also drink more, then smoking will confound the association between alcohol consumption and, and throat cancer unless it's controlled for. So this is another example of confounding. This is a socioeconomic status and um, mortality um, so it's looking at increase uh, in the mean black smoke concentration on any given day and the percentage increase in mortality. And you can see that the uh, increasing 
socioeconomic status is, seems to be in this example associated with a higher percentage increase in mortality. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, in epidemiological investigations, we uh, we don't generally rely on a single study unless it's huge and free from bias and the results are so overwhelming that it would be impossible for the findings to be due to chance, bias or confounding. In most situations, we have a number of studies that are less powerful than that and we have to weigh up um, the strength of evidence across a number of studies. And so Bradford Hill in the mid 1960s devised a set of considerations that one should consider when trying to determine whether an association is causal or not. And he didn't intend this to be used as a checklist, more that these were things that you should consider. So the stronger an association, the more likely it is to be causal. If you have consistent findings observed by different people in different places, that strengthens the likelihood of an effect. If the causation is likely, if there's a very specific population at a specific site and disease, so for example, the other example I mentioned of angiosarcoma of the liver um, in workers exposed to vinyl chloride monomer, there's a very specific association and a very specific disease outcome. Temporality, temporality is the only absolute requirement uh, and it's an obvious one that the exposure has to occur before the disease. Biological gradient can be helpful. Um, so the greater the exposure, the greater the incidence of the effect and plausibility um, so making reference to um, sort of animal data or other information that suggests an association could happen perhaps sort of biochemistry uh, could add plausibility to a finding being determined as being causal coherence um, is is similar so you get a similar finding between epidemiological studies and perhaps laboratory findings looking at in vitro or in vivo studies and occasionally it may be possible to do experimental st studies but it's, it's rare that you'll get ethical approval to expose people to nasty substances and the final um, final criterion is analogy um, when the effect of similar factors might be considered. So if you've got a group of arsenic compounds, um, they may all have the same effect on lung cancer, for example. So just coming to the, the end of this with some sort of concluding remarks, because um, I did want to leave some time for questions and I have some more slides if if people want me to move on to one or two other topics. So in terms of the future of occupational epidemiology, well, there are always new substances being introduced into workplaces and new agents that need to be studied. Sometimes we know from analogy what their likely health effects are going to be, but sometimes they can have um, unexpected consequences. We think we've probably identified all the major risks in uh, workforce populations. It doesn't mean that they're well controlled in practice. And sometimes some governments insist on doing epidemiological studies to show that there's a problem in their own country before they'd be willing to act. It's difficult to study mixtures. Um, when you get complex mixtures um, in order to be able to identify which component of the mixture might be giving rise to the harm. Um, there's lots of unanswered questions still there. Molecular approaches for exposure and disease markers are becoming more and more prominent in, prominent in the epidemiological literature. Um, but again, we've a long way to go um, before we can um, 
had those as routinely reliable studies. There's a new concept which is the subject of a great deal of interest and in research at the moment, which is um, the concept defined by Dr. Chris Wilde, the former director of the International Agency for Research on Cancer, who termed the, the, um, the concept of the exposome, where we're interested in looking at exposures from the conception to the grave. So in other words, looking at all the exposures an individual might have received throughout the life course in order to understand what genetic and environmental risk risks that person has been exposed to. And finally, um, occupational epidemiologists are being dragged more and more into the analysis of workplace interventions. And these are the kinds of studies which uh, funders are looking for now, but they are very hard to um, produce definitive findings from, usually because results are very context dependent and um, we also have the long latency issues to consider. So um, I'm going to sort of leave off there. As I say, I've got some more slides if if we run out of questions, uh, but I, I, I'm happy to uh, to open it up for questions. Now I realise I've gone at a fairly fast pace as well. Um, so um, happy, as I say, to take questions now. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel, for a very nice presentation. I'm gonna upload from far away. I believe your presentation was uh, a really good one because it gave like the plethora of issues that uh, our researchers should take into account when they deal with population health, public health, environmental health issues, occupational health issues as well in this case, because many of these principles obviously apply to public health, not only in occupational settings, but also in environmental settings. Yeah. So okay. you're uh, obviously, you cannot cover everything in uh, one webinar. We, we understand this and uh, our researchers understand this. So I would like to open the floor for some clarifying questions or other type of questions that uh, our audience might have. Any questions, comments from uh, the floor? Anybody? Hi. Hi. This is Corina Costantino here. Hi, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I would like to ask something about um, you were mentioning on the disease incident rate and how we calculate them. Uh, yeah. you, you mentioned about uh, the over or the under reporting. Um, is there a way to deal with this before uh, starting a, a study or maybe taking account of this uh, with, uh, I mean, we had only mentioned it in the limitations, but also trying to consider this? Yeah, so I, I guess you're t where this mainly occurs is in the context of recall bias in case control studies. Mm -hmm. So often if, if researchers go into a workplace and ask people who've got a disease have you been exposed to substance X it's a well-known phenomenon that, that cases are more likely to respond that they were even when they're not and likewise controls are probably more likely to do the opposite and struggle to remember that they were exposed to substance X even though they were so that can distort the odds ratio in case control studies and the best way around it really is to and it's not always possible but is to try and rely on more objective measures of exposure such as from occupational records and perhaps combine that with some expert occupational hygiene assessment rather than relying on the self-report of an individual. So that's it's more easy to get um, exposure estimates in a prospective cohort study because you can make attempts to objectively collect exposure data 
in a, in a systematic and well-documented way that you can't do when you go when you're looking to go back in time for a case control study. So the key is try to use as objective a source of information on exposures as you can. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Corinna, for the question. Any other questions? Hello. <laughs> um, hello. Hello. This is my name is Elena. I'm a PhD candidate, and thank you for the pre presentation. It uh, the structure uh, uh, was excellent, and it was very easy to follow. I just have a question on your last um, uh, comment that you've said about the workplace interventions. Yes. Uh, do you have like an example to provide uh, for from um, such an intervention and uh, what uh, would a researcher would have to take into account in order to develop uh, such an intervention in a workplace? Um, okay, so um, I do, if we we're talking about sort of something like a chemical agent, rather than an ergonomic. Most of, the, most of the workplace interventions that I'm aware of have usually been in the field of uh, ergonomics or uh, mental health rather than to do with chemical exposures because often chemical exposures are regulated in such a way that you're supposed to derive, drive the exposures down to as low as practicable. Um, whereas that's not always what happens with ergonomic and psychosocial risks and a lot of uh, studies have been done on ergonomic risk factors which um, are aimed at trying to prevent people from suffering from musculoskeletal conditions later in life and I think funders when they fund these type of investigations often don't like to have answers over a 10 or 15 year period, which is what sometimes what you need to, to uh, that needs to be your observation window sometimes. So in order for you to then be able to demonstrate um, that in the workplace where you've applied the intervention, there was a reduced rate of, for example, ergonomic or musculoskeletal disorders as a consequence of the intervention. So often there's pressure to try and look for relatively quick reductions in incidence of disease. And sometimes another problem is that the, the type of intervention is very specific to the workplace and isn't generalizable. Which, which makes it difficult to translate the findings from that workforce perhaps into another workforce where the circumstances may be a little bit different. So there might be a different organisational culture, for example, or if you're crossing national boundaries, there may be you know, cultural issues as to why that that intervention may not work in one situation, but would work in another. Mm -hmm. Have I answered your question? Uh, um, more or less, yes, but it's like uh, new questions pop up uh, around uh, this type of uh, interventions and how, how, uh, how their applicability, how easy to apply such an intervention would be. Um, in the near future at least but yeah um... I mean I think I think another thing I could add is that if you're thinking about a psychosocial intervention then often you need to intervene at the organizational level and bring about a change in culture within the yes. organization before you can hope to influence things at an individual level mm -hmm. okay Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Damian, let me yeah. ask you also a question. So based on your opinion and your experience, how, what is the demand right now in Europe for uh, researchers that hold, let's say, a PhD in 
in public health yeah. or a PhD in occupational health? Um, I have to be honest and say that there's more interest in research funders for issues relating to public and environmental health than there is in relation to occupational health. However, that said, um, there, is an, there is still an interest in work and health and in general in relation to well-being. So um, if we're looking at things holistic, from a public health perspective, I think it's important that public health uh, issues include consideration of occupational and environmental issues and, and that's that's probably the way to keep occupational issues you know at the forefront of um, of politicians and research funders minds I think a lot of it stems from the fact that particularly in Western Europe um, there's been a huge reduction in the amount of industrial manufacturing that has taken place and a lot of that production has been exported to the third world developing world you know Africa Asia and parts of South America where labor is a lot cheaper and a lot of the a lot of the workers in those countries are now exposed to risks that used to be ex used to be um, associated with workers in Western Europe in the past. So that globalization, I think, is a real issue. And there's, um, in my eyes, there's a, in, in Western Europe, we have a, a duty to understand when we take a product from, from those countries, we need to understand, you know, have people been injured in the production of, or, you know, or otherwise had their health damaged in the production of those products that have brought them to the, you know, to the marketplace in Western Europe. And, and I don't think that's, a, I think that personally, that's an issue that doesn't get anywhere near the amount of intention, attention that it should do. Indeed. Indeed. Yeah, that's difficult to bring to surface because it's not visible by any yeah. means, easily at least, it's not easily visible. And indeed, this is something that sooner or later, I think the whole world will have to face because also in this middle and lower income countries, regulations become a little bit more stringent gradually. Yeah. So eventually I mean, we'll have to be... I think a lot of it is, is large multinational organizations taking advantage of less uh, well-developed and policed occupational health and safety systems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, very interesting point. Uh, any remaining uh, comments or questions from anyone? No. It looks like, uh, you know, we are covered. Okay. Everything is, uh, I believe, answered. So thank you very much for your time, Damien, one more time again. You're very and welcome. Please send me the, um, the presentation when you can so that we can also share it with the rest researchers here at CII. Okay. And if, if any have any questions that occur to them after the presentation, or, or when they see the slides, um, then I'm happy to happy to take questions by email. Great, great. We appreciate that. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel. Okay, you're welcome. Okay. Okay. Well, with that, uh, we're finishing the the seminar. Thank you very much, everybody, and we're looking forward to the next webinar speaker, which will be in a couple of weeks, again from IOM. Yeah. So please stay tuned. Thank you. Bye for Bye. now. Bye. Bye.